Bye bye, Alexei Reznikov. He is no more. He, well, he is now the Ukrainian ambassador to the UK. <laughs> That's another story of the revolving door of corruption that is the Ukrainian regime. But Alexei Reznikov has been sacked as defense minister. And this was a long time coming. The corruption scandals have been enormous. This has been a months long issue. And I'm going to pull up a New York Times article very soon to talk about uh, how the collective West is now acknowledging this. But Alexei Reznikov was sacked on September 4th. He put in his letter of resignation. The parliament voted on it. And Zelensky told the media, uh, told the public that uh, this was needed because the Ukrainian military, the defense ministry needs uh, a, a new blood. It needs a, a new direction. So Alexei Reznikov is gone. And this, this comes in the heels of this failing counteroffensive. Uh, there, have been, there has been scandal after scandal after scandal with Reznikov. The biggest one being <laughs> that Ukraine's military has really been unable to account for its spending in this conflict. Uh, and I'm going to get to a hilarious gesture made by Reznikov at the end of his t tenure, right before he ended up uh, leaving. He, he resigned and then he gave the actual numbers of what they've been sending because he wanted to refute the fact that even the collective West is admitting, where is the money going? The money goes to Ukraine and millions upon millions, if not billions of it, ends up gone without any account that, that there's been more taken than actually spent. And uh, this has been a huge waste. This has been a huge blemish on the image of the collective West. It was obvious that Reznikov was going to have to go. And in my opinion, none of this would have happened because I don't think that the United States and NATO really care about <laughs> corruption. They obviously don't because the United States, uh, fun fact, funds and arms 70 percent of the world's quote unquote dictatorships, really client regimes that are heavily militarized to oppress their own people and then to help the United States wage war. But the United States funds and arms 70 percent of them. So that is not a problem for the United States. The United States created this situation through a coup. It installed a client regime, and then elections were held uh, around five years later that legitimized it as some kind of parliamentary democracy. But it never any such thing. This is a corrupt client regime of the United States and NATO. And Reznikov's behavior has been, uh, uh, there is no other way to describe it, abhorrent even to the United States. And the United States has described it as graft. And here is the story. So this is what happened. OK, and this is an interesting report because it really does show a level of. I guess you could say tardy honesty, right? Kind of late honesty. There's a phrase that the kids like to say, you're late. Well, the United States tends to be late on public in, on on information. It doesn't want public until it just can't hold it in anymore. That is the nature of how the U.S. conducts warfare, psychological warfare, military warfare, political warfare, you name it, economic warfare. The secrets of it, the ins and outs, they're not going to give until they can't hold on to it any longer. So where's the money? Military graft becomes a headache for Ukraine. The removal of the defense minister highlights the enduring challenge of corruption in Ukraine, which has emerged as a rare area of criticism of Vladimir Zelensky's leadership, a rare area. So you never have to worry about the collective West mainstream media glossing over all of this with this idea that this is some kind of rarity, right? So uh, this rare criticism, right, of Zelensky's leadership is so amazing, except in this corruption piece, right? So the removal of Ukraine's Minister of Defense after a flurry of reports of graft in financial mismanagement, his department underscores a pivotal challenge of Zelensky's wartime leadership, stamping out corruption that had been widespread in Ukraine for years. Official corruption was a topic that had been mostly taboo throughout the first year of the war as Ukrainians rallied around their government in a fight for national survival. No, Ukrainians weren't the one rallying around. <laughs> what was being rallied around was NATO covering it all up in order to paint uh, uh, Zelensky's government as some kind of democracy because they wanted to make Russia out to be the autocracy. 
So Mr. Zelensky's announcement Sunday night that he was replacing Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov elevated the issue to the highest level of Ukrainian politics. It comes at a pivotal time in the war as Ukraine prosecutes and a counteroffensive in the country's south and east that relies heavily on Western allies' military assistance. These allies have, since the beginning of the war, pressured Zelensky to ensure that Ukrainian officials weren't siphoning off some of the billions of dollars in aid that were flowing to Ukraine. Oh, well, that was a huge failure. Look at Zelensky himself. Look at look at the way Zelensky lives. I don't, mind you, you have Zelensky's wife gallivanting in France. There were photos of that. And she was buying luxury items. There were rumors that what she purchased was in the tens of thousands of dollars. So just last week, the United States' national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, met with three ranking Ukrainian officials to discuss efforts to stamp out wartime corruption. It comes as some lawmakers in the U.S. have used graft as an argument for limiting military aid to Ukraine. So you can expect then that that conversation that Sullivan had led to this change. The United States sent Sullivan. Sullivan said, hey, you got to make a change. This isn't working. And Ukraine made the change. That shows the character of what Ukraine's government really is. It is a, a yes government of the United States. Zelensky responded to the pressure from allies with and criticism at home with a flurry of anti-corruption initiatives, not all of them welcomed by experts on government transparency. The most controversial has been a proposal to use martial law powers to punish corruption as treason. Reznikov, who had held a range of positions during Mr. Zelensky's tenure, submitted his resignation Monday morning, so that was the fourth. He has not been personally implicated in the allegations of mismanaged military contracts, but the winding investigations at his military at his ministry pose a first significant challenge to the government anti-corruption measures since the start of Russia's invasion. The question here is, where's the money? Said Executive Director at Anti-Corruption Action Center in Ukraine, Daria Kelyanik, a group dedicated to rooting out public graft now focused on war profiteering. Corruption can kill, said Ms. Kelyanik. Uh, depending on how effective we are guarding public funds, a soldier will have a weapon or not have a weapon. Well, it's not. Let's be honest here. It's not just about whether corruption is happening or not. We have to understand that Ukraine is burning through weapons. So there's many a myriad of problems here. Ukraine is burning through artillery. It's burning through its tanks. It's burning through every single piece of weaponry it's been given. And then, of course, you have the of course, you have the problem of corruption. That's a part of it. Yes. But what do you think? Don't you think that a losing war effort being taken part by a client regime that was literally installed with the leadership of far right fascists and neo Nazi forces? Don't you think there's going to be corruption there? Don't you think that putting Azov in the National Guard, putting Azov in major battle units in a war against Russia is going to deal in corruption? I mean, this is the fantasy that the collective West lives in. Uh, they try to bury any of these possibilities and, and then talk about them only after the problem becomes too large to ignore. So at one point this year, about $980 million in weapons contracts had missed their delivery dates, according to government figures. And some payments for weapons had vanished into overseas accounts of weapons dealers, according to reports made by Ukraine's parliament. Though precise details have not emerged, the irregularities suggest that procurement officials in the ministry did not vet suppliers or allow weapons dealers to walk off with money without delivering armaments. And do you think that someone like Reznikov and his uh, uh, subordinates would just let contractors walk without a piece of that cake? Come on, let's be honest here. This is all, while the New York Times is trying its best to uh, talk about corruption, they're leaving out the fact that this is a dialectical relationship you just don't have contractors walking off without complicity, if not outright participation, from the, the folks that they're walking off from. They're getting a cut. This is, this is straight from the corruption handbook. Ukrainian media reports have pointed to overpayments for basic supplies for the army, such as food and winter coats. The public revelations of mismanagement so far have not directly touched foreign weapons transferred to the Ukrainian army or Western aid money, but they are nevertheless piercing the sense of unquestioning support for the government that Ukrainians had exhibited throughout the first year of Russia's full-scale invasion. By what measure? So here we go. Uh, they're saying that Ukraine's government is fully supported and everyone love, loves Ukrainian government. Well, who's measuring that? Who's taking those polls? Because last time I checked, Ukraine put the entire 
society, what was left of it after Russia was able to federate, uh, bring into the Russian Federation uh, the Donbass regions. After that, well, you had millions upon millions of Ukrainians leaving. I talked to Dmitry Polanski, the ambassador uh, to the UN from Russia. He said, we have millions of Ukrainians living in Russia right now. So you have massive migration and then you have martial law and forced conscription. So is this really love or is this uh, <laughs> or is this coercion? So two officials with Defense Ministry, Deputy Minister and the head of procurement were arrested during the winter over reports of purchase overpriced, purchasing overpriced eggs for the army. Zelensky fired the heads of military recruitment offices last month after allegations emerged that some took bribes from people seeking to avoid the draft. He, his proposed initiative to treat corruption as treason set off a wave of criticism that it could lead to abuse of martial law powers. So, you know, uh, there's more here. Um, let's go to Reznikov, though. Reznikov viewed his principal job as rallying allies to provide weaponry. He was not directly responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the war. His dismissal is not seen as linked to the slow progress of Ukraine's counteroffensive. Again, more... Uh, how do you call it? pearl clutching, trying to protect the counteroffensive, which is failing. And I'm going to argue, I'm going to show you the data. Uh, it's pretty damning. I think that there's, it is something to do with the counteroffensive. But now military spending accounts for nearly half of Ukraine's national budget and reports of contracting scandals point to a shift in sources of public corruption. Before the invasion, the primary source of embezzlement had been poorly run state companies, which there were more then 3000 on the government's balance sheet. Money was siphoned off through a myriad of schemes by wealthy insiders, while the national budget, propped up by foreign aid, absorbed the losses. Well, that's because there was widespread shock therapy. Ukraine, after the fall of the Soviet Union, experienced its own kind of shock therapy. And then, of course, after um, Yanukovych was overthrown, those austerity measures that were put into place by the coup government allowed this kind of thing to happen. This is what they don't want to tell you, that Poroshenko and forces like that were allowing the widespread sell-off of massive public assets, pensions, and the like. So Ukrainian investigative journalists have highlighted overpayment for basic supplies of the armies, like eggs, um, for 47 cents each. Oof. 47 cents each eggs. Oh, my gosh. Far above prevailing prices, according to a report uh, by Ukrainian newspaper, canned beans were bought for Turkey at more than the price for the same cans in Ukrainian supermarkets. The newspaper reported, even though the military would be expected to purchase less at re than retail prices. The ministry also bought thousands of coasts that turned out to be insufficiently insulated for Ukraine's bitter winters. Western donors are now closely watching how Ukraine tackles the problem. The chairwoman of the Ukrainian Parliament's anti-corruption campaign, Anastasia Radina, said in an interview, particularly worrying is the proposal to punish corruption as treason because it could allow domestic intelligence agencies like the SBU, which is under the direct control of the president, to investigate official corruption. So, again, there's going to be more and more corruption. Corruption begets corruption. It's not going to stop. It's in every area. I mean, these are basic areas we're talking about. We're talking about some basic things here, like aid and supplies. The entire Ukrainian government has been in on essentially embezzling and, and working with the most corrupt forces to <laughs> essentially uh, uh, make, lives, make the lives of Ukrainians even harder, as if it wasn't hard enough fighting a proxy war on behalf of the United States. So last week when Ms. Uh, Jake Sullivan... Um, met with it met with Ukrainian officials. This included the heads of specialized investigative agency, a prosecutorial office, and a court that were set up after Ukraine's Western political pivot in 2014. Ah, you see, he, Jake Sullivan was meeting with the institutions of the coup to clean up these institutions, which were inherently corrupt. You do not institute a foreign-backed Western-backed milita uh, mil uh, military coup, you don't do that, right? And this military coup is backed by far-right bandits, fascist bandits. You don't do that without corruption. They're calling it a pivot, a Western political pivot, with the help of the United States and international lenders such as the IMF. These are Ukrainian agencies that could lose power under Zelensky's treason proposal. Oh, so they're worried about their already corrupt institutions becoming uh, damaged by the corrupt Zelensky. This is indeed uh, 
what the kids say these days. This is a hot mess. This is a mess. Western governments are wary of the agency's potential weakening, Miss Redina said. And if the, if the proposals go forward, most likely they will object. But overall, uh, Miss Redina, a member of Zelensky's governing servant of the People Party, defended the government's effort to fend off graft in wartime. So in a sense, um, they leave us with the uh, words of um, high-level uh, director of transparency international in Ukraine, Andrei Barov. He says that rather than indication of a nation bogged down by insider dealing, it shows that the country can fight the war and graft at the same time. Scandals are good. The war cannot be an excuse to stop fighting corruption. So that's how they spin it. So again, this is how the collective West likes to do things. They know that there is a problem. Reznikov is gone. There's a problem here. They can't deny that there's a problem, right? Reznikov was part of multiple corruption scandals from hundreds of millions of dollars gone from the uh, supply of aid, right? The military spending in Ukraine gone. We don't know where it went. There's some rumors that Reznikov spent it on himself, although the Western media says, no, he didn't buy a mansion. So there's conflicting reports there. But nonetheless, he is going to be the ambassador of the UK now. So we can expect that he was part of the he made he made out from this. And not only this, but the way that the collective West is now framing this is, uh, can you believe it? They're saying that it's good. They're actually fighting corruption now. And by getting rid of Reznikov, it's part of their efforts to do so, even as their scandal after scandal paying 47 cents per egg. Per egg, uh, buying coats in mass that couldn't even help freezing soldiers and families that are being thrown into the graveyard because of this proxy war. I mean, does it get any lower than this? Well, Reznikov is he he was a pretty bad dude. If we're going to use Joe Biden's words, Reznikov was not a good dude, and uh, Reznikov. At the end of his tenure, this is what he had to do. This is what he had to say. So he was obviously forced to do this. But here's a little insight into the kind of information that these corrupt Ukrainian puppets are hiding. Ukraine is spending $100 million a day on the conflict. You, you heard that, right? Right. $100 million U.S. dollars a day. Volunteers have provided only 3% of war supplies during the hostilities. He's yet rejecting corruption allegations. So even as he's being sacked, this is, look at, look at this smiling guy. Look at him smile. He's so happy because he got a job. He was told by the Collective West, get out. Zelensky told, was told by Jake Sullivan, Reznikov's got to go. Zelensky and Reznikov agreed. Parliament agreed. Now he's gone. Look at him smile. He's smiling. He's happy. And that's because he made out good. He's got a nice new job. And uh, uh, Kiev has been spending $100 million a day. And a lot of that money has been going to embezzlement. So a lot of people are being made happy in this conflict. Kiev has been spending $100 million a day on the conflict, said the outgoing Alexei Reznikov. The official made the remarks in an interview with state-run media outlet Ukraineform, published on Monday in which he rejected corruption allegations and defended the ministry's procurement policies during his tenure. Reznikov dismissed claims that the country's military has been largely supplied by volunteers and crowdfunding, stating that such was simply unfair given that the government is spending $100 million daily on the conflict. I know all the budgets spent on supplies for the army. These provided by volunteers and officially by the state. I can tell you the supplies from volunteers from February 24, 2022 are, uh, to date are just 3% of everything that went to the war. Reznikov claimed that the corruption scandals around the military and labels eagerly handed out by critics have already scared businessmen away from working with the defense ministry. I routinely meet with large associations, speak at large forums, and they say it is not comfortable for us to strike contracts with the Ministry of Defense and other state institutions because law enforcement agencies immediately begin to bother us and seize our accounts. So what he's saying is there's no corruption. There never was. This is this these 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 are be it's a beauty, right? I mean, this is a uh, he's he is going out without any dignity, right? No dignity. He he was caught. The government has been caught. He's not going to go out there and say, ah, we made mistakes, right? Pull the old Obama. You know, we killed some folks. So we made mistakes in Libya. Reznikov is not going to do that. He is going out with uh, his you-know-what swinging, saying nothing was wrong. 
Everywhere you look, everyone is corrupt. There are no decent people in the world, suggesting that the ministry's critics universally see their activities as a crusade against rear rats and corruptors within the ministry. So, so that there's the outlook, right? Everyone is corrupt. So why target me? Um, the outgoing minister assumed his post in 2021 in November, shortly after the conflict between Russia and Ukraine broke, before the conflict between Russia and Ukraine broke out. His tenure has been marred by multiple corruption scandals, but the ministry repeatedly accused of procuring equipment and foodstuffs from the military at abnormally high prices. Reznikov's interview comes after Ukrainian President Zelensky announced on Sunday his plan to sack Reznikov, seeking to replace him with current head of the state property front of Ukraine, Rustem Umarov. Explains his decision, the president of the defense ministry said the defense ministry needs new approaches, new formats to interact both with the military and society as a whole. Reznikov offered his resignation on September 4th. So there you have it. Reznikov is gone. Uh, Reznikov, so I covered this. So this is like part of the Reznikov highlight reel. You know, we have his beginning. We have how he uh, went out with zero dignity. And, you know, Reznikov, uh, he was someone who was not the smartest uh, bulb in the bunch, let's say. And, and this was back in January. This was back when there was the tank conversation. Uh, Reznikov, he has always been a deep insider. And he is someone whose tongue sometimes gets a little too, how should I say, uh, f fast and loose. And so back in January, he said that Ukraine was actually on a NATO mission. And so that's why NATO should give more weapons. <laughs> Kiev is shedding blood to carry out a NATO mission set for itself and expects the civilized West to provide weapons and ammunition in return for its service, Reznikov said in an interview with the domestic TV channel. So he said, today Ukraine is addressing that threat of Russia. We're carrying out NATO's mission today without shedding their blood. We shed our blood, so we expect them to provide weapons. And so all of this, right, all of this saying that we are, you know, shedding our blood for NATO, this admission of truth. I mean, this was true, but all of it was to benefit himself, right? This is the mark of corruption. I generally don't even like to use the word corruption because I believe that this system and especially the system that is funding and arming Ukraine, this constellation of institutions, uh, the main one being NATO that is propping up Ukraine, it is inherently corrupt. We don't need, we can't even we don't even have to call it corrupt because there was nothing to uncorrupt. It was what it was and it is what it is. It is an imperial venture. It is. It is completely and utterly steeped in war profiteering. And Reznikov, well, he's a sacrificial lamb in what is going to continue to be a corrupt venture. War, this kind of war, a war uh, by proxy, a war to fight Russia uh, on the basis of what would always was always going to be a losing venture is a breeding ground for so-called corruption or better yet, it's a breeding ground for what it always was, which is a, a, a losing war, but a war that nonetheless has its benefits and its objectives for the collective West. And that these are never going to be turned back on because this is existential for the West. It's about destroying Russia. So if you want to destroy Russia, you're going to have to do some bad things. Bad things are part of the fabric. They don't just happen just because this is not the good gone bad, right? There just wasn't any good in this. This was always evil. And this is not even moralistic. This is objective. <laughs> this evil is objective. It is part and parcel of the uh, entire system. It is baked into everything that the United States as an empire and NATO as an empire is. And so... Here's what, and, and they say, oh, this has nothing to do with the failed counteroffensive. Well, let's, come on, let's, be, let's, let's not live in a fantasy world here. Let's live in reality. Here are the latest numbers. This is from TASS. Sergei Shoigu recently gave the latest numbers as part of the report from the Defense Ministry of Russia. And it's not looking great. All right, let's, and, and, you know, they always want to refute these numbers, but they never have numbers themselves, the collective West, I'm saying. Or Ukraine, right? They never want to uh, bring out numbers that uh, uh, we can really work with. And when they do, 
uh, they're always likely undercounts. And then we find out later that there was a lot more casualties than Ukraine ever wanted to admit. The collective West themselves, they don't want to do any counting. Russia, mind you, though, is doing a lot of counting. Why? Because they're creating a lot of bodies for Ukrainian armed forces. So Sergei Shoyu says that Kiev has lost 66,000 people in the last three months and has failed to achieve its goals. The most tense situations developed in the Zaporozhye area where the enemy has committed into battle strategic reserve brigades whose personnel have been trained under the guidance of Western instructors. So on September 5th, Shoigu said that Ukrainian forces have lost more than 66,000 people and 7,600 units of weaponry since the start of the so-called counteroffensive. He stated the Ukrainian military failed to achieve its goal in all areas. The minister also reviewed the results of a recent Army 2023 conference, plans to replenish transport and long-range aircraft, and training given to military cadets in the use of drones. So here are some highlights. So there you have the 7,600 weaponry units lost 66,000 people. In no area did the Ukrainian armed forces achieve their goals, trying to hide the failure of the offensive. Ukrainian militants attack civilian facilities and pass these terrorist attacks off as victories. Uh, that's the biggest and most important point here is that the situation is indeed desperate, right? It is very, very desperate. Uh <laughs> it, and that's not just from Shoigu. I'm going to show you in a second that this isn't just from Shoigu. This isn't just Russian propaganda. We are seeing the collective West uh, uh, admit itself that the situation is indeed quite desperate. So you have massive losses, 66,000 plus casualties for Ukraine deaths, really. And you also have 7,600 military units, uh, weaponry units gone. And you also have the fact that they achieved none of their objectives. And mind you, they are on this desperate, uh, just out of control. I mean, it's just a desperate out of control campaign, a drone campaign to hit civilian areas and then pass it off as having some kind of leverage, having some kind of higher ground against Russia. Again, nothing could be further from the truth because these drone attacks are not effective either. I mean, it, it really is. It's both desperate and it's pitiful. I mean, it's. It, I'd be sad, but at the same time, their cause is not just a losing one, but it's bankrupt to the core. I mean, we're talking about a proxy war against Russia that has all of the elements of uh, fascism and Cold War um, uh, threats just woven into it. So there is no tears for this. But at the same time, the, the, the deaths are just, it's stunning because it just shows the lengths the collective West will go. They don't care one bit about Ukrainians because they, they, they're dying. And so I want to show you Max. So you might remember Max Boot, and I'm not going to read this entire article. But Max Boot had this to say. He wrote this in the Washington Post the same day that Mr. Reznikov was ousted. He said a retired U.S. general blames America for Ukraine's slow counteroffensive. So he has this, you can't even call it an interview. They love to do this at the Post. So what they'll do is they'll get resident neocons like Max Boot. And, and I'll show you who Max Boot really is. He, he, he's tried to make himself look like a, a neoliberal. He's always been a hardcore neocon for most of his career. Uh, and then he became a hardcore neoliberal with all this ideologue BS against Trump. But he's always been a staunch warmonger. And uh, he's you know at the Council of Foreign Relations, which is really the premier think tank for the U.S. empire. But here he talks to Mark Arnold, retired U.S. Army Brigade general. And he describes Arnold as a cheerful special forces officer with three combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. He's a war criminal. I spent an extensive time near the front lines advising the Ukrainian military. So here is what you have. You have a, a, someone who's directly advising, a retired general, a directly advising a war criminal, Ukrainian's military during this conflict. He was always impressed by the professionalism and elan of the Ukrainian military, while cognizant of limitations of training equipment they've been provided by the West. So again, whitewashing what was already known as a very corrupt and a failing institution, the Ukrainian military. So, you know, he met Arnold back in May. So blah, 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 right? So 
Uh, he asked about his opinions on the war in Ukraine, where he lamented Ukrainians lack the mobility and equipment necessary to breach high density minefields and obstacles. U.S. Army mechanized infantry and armored battalions have tanks and anti tank mine blades and heavy rollers in each company teams. The Ukrainians do not. This article, mind you, this interview is all about how this general says the U.S. needs to stop fooling around and get right to it, fortify Ukraine, militarize Ukraine to the point where it can get through all any and all of Russia's defenses without acknowledging the shortcomings of such a strategy, without acknowledging how outstretched the United States already is, all the admissions. Biden will even say his adult brain. He'll go on the media and say, hey, the Ukrainians, we're running out of ammunition. The Ukrainians don't have it. It doesn't matter. He he. This is just a neocon attempt to push forward even further while admitting things are bad, okay? It's not just mining equipment that the Ukrainians are short of. Last week, Arnold emailed me. I mean, this is just insider stuff, right? So, so Reznikov, right, is just the tip of the iceberg of corruption. This right here, this, this right here, this is all corruption. <laughs> what we are seeing, okay, what we are seeing in... And you see, I can't get my thumbs right here. This is corruption. This is getting emails from retired army generals who are advising Ukrainians military as a so-called journalist telling you, hey, can you promote my war propaganda for me without any challenge with just, just verbatim? That's, that's corrupt. If you had all the Bradley vehicles, Leopard 2 and Challenger 2 tanks and other equipment, the Ukrainians could outfit only one brigade. And they only had one, which was the elite 82nd Brigade thrown out to the counteroffensive. Only six battalions of the 350 battalions and the ground forces have been trained and combined arms by NATO, simply not enough to move the needle. So there you go. They're admitting, I don't even have to go through this whole article because believe me, you do not want to hear this warmongering blowhard go on and on and on. But the point here is that while this uh, Arnold fella, he, this retired general who's been advising the military, wants to complain and complain and complain, he doesn't want to acknowledge the shortcomings here, that Ukraine is never going to be fortified enough to defeat Russia. And that's not even the point here. The point is also that this is a proxy war. This is not a good thing for the United States. It is only going to drain the United States like it's drained Europe. And that's why the United States has stayed semi out of this conflict. It stayed a little bit at a distance because, or not out of the conflict, but it stayed, it has stayed out of the worst excesses of it. It's delayed its support. It has uh, gone on all kinds of gymnastics and pretzels, twisting, all kinds of things to prolong the conflict, but not, but not enough to get into an outright confrontation with Russia, like this gentleman is saying. So while some of the United States criticized Kiev's conduct in the counteroffensive, which appears to be gaining some momentum, blah, 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 Arnold does not. The U.S. military would be hard-pressed to achieve much better results without air dominance and long-range military systems, he said. So I am pleased with the progress Ukrainians have demonstrated to date. So they don't have enough to do anything to move the needle. But he's proud of the progress. I mean, this is spoken like a true cynic of permanent war. He rejects the specific criticism made by the Pentagon on Ukraine, including that they've diverted too many resources to back moot, back moot in the east. He argues the offensive there has not consumed large volumes of mechanized equipment. Ukraine operations in multiple geographic areas are essential to tying down Russian military forces and defending Ukrainian ground in the northeast. So again, over and over and over again, we see the admissions. It's like, I don't even want to call it, it's, I don't want to call it a bipolar it is just direct, just uh, these hip this hypocrisy and these contradictions just swirling around. They don't stop swirling. Well, Ukraine has done great, but they don't have enough to move the needle. They don't have enough, but they've done so much with what they've had. They're doing great. They need more, but they're doing great, but they're not doing too good. So they need more, right? They just it. This is the adult brain on empire this is what's happening empire in decline and so i just want to show you who max boot is because as you see that shameless shameless neocon shilling there i mean shameless but there is no shame for someone like max boot and so uh max boot <laughs> this is what this is his how should i say um i i need to make this one bigger because i'm not going to be able to this is his, how should I say, 
celebratory moment in life. This is what he is most well known for. So back during the Iraq war, Max Boot was just a traditional neocon who wrote for the Weekly Standard. And his article, The Case for Empire, still follows him around to this day. When other publications talk about Max Boot, this is what they talk about. They talk about someone who literally, who literally was carrying water for the Iraq war and making the case for the American empire. The most realistic response to terrorism is for America to embrace its imperial role. What does that mean? It means destroying Iraq, destroying Afghanistan. And he makes the case that uh, if you look at, I'm not going to read that article. I just want to show you who he is. He makes the case that, oh, well, destroying Yugoslavia was actually a great thing to do. So why not continue onward, embrace this imperial role? We need to get rid of, quote unquote, terrorism, which was always just a cover for empire, which produced actually more terrorism that the United States directly supported and still does in places like Syria and across northern Africa. So this is the situation the empire finds itself in. It, it is it is quite pathetic. Um, this is a desperate situation for Ukraine. Alexei, Re Alexei Reznikov's resignation is not some good thing for Ukraine's government. It's not some wholehearted attempt, this heartwarming attempt to ease corruption. This was the United States saying, get your SHIT together, Ukraine, and you need to do this for us. But also, it has to do with this offensive. This offensive is failing. And every time there's adversity with Ukraine on the battlefield, there's mounting tensions within this proxy government. This proxy war fought by a proxy government is facing increasing instability and, of course, increasing illegitimacy. Ukraine's population is decimated. It is mass migrated. It is impoverished. It is starving. And here you have Reznikov uh, leading a defense ministry, which was overpaying for coats and eggs and siphoning off military uh, aid. And it doesn't, while well, the collective West is saying, oh, well, it's not our aid that we can prove has been siphoned off in corrupt grafting scandals. Alexei Reznikov is kind of saying the opposite. He's saying, actually, we are spending $100 million a day, and most of that is coming from outside support. Most of that is coming from official contracts, which would then seem to implicate Western military aid, collective West, NATO military aid, in these grafting scandals. Duh. Right? Like, of course it does. And let's not, let, and let's not uh, ignore the fact that NATO is itself full of graft. It is it just a, a complete um, trough of military contracts, uh, of, of public money siphoned from governments in NATO to spend on private military contracts, which most of the time are just profiteering schemes to, to dump weapons, to produce old weapons, to produce weapons that don't do anything and essentially leave the governments with the bill. Right. So, so that is inherently corrupt. The system is inherently corrupt. Reznikov was always going to be a corrupt official. He is a sacrificial lamb for a larger problem that Ukraine is experiencing. That problem being that they're losing that they're losing legitimacy, that their tanks are burning on the battlefield, NATO tanks are burning on the battlefield, that they're losing tens of thousands of men to the point where they're not going to have any left. The rainy season's coming. The cold season is coming. It's not looking good for Ukraine. And Reznikov's resignation is confirmation of that. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. 
Thank you so much and I look forward to the next video.